All righty. Thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. Um, so there are a few things that I'd like to run through today. Um, basically, as uh, Tim was talking about, we're just going to give you an overview of a very simple comparison um, of uh, sort of what we would deem to be a standard off-the-shelf DIY servo platform and uh, our Cube servo platform. It's a very simple solution. This isn't uh, nearly the complexity of some of our systems. Um, but this will give you a glimpse into some of the things that you'd encounter if you were creating the system yourself and some of the things that we have to take into account when we create a system to watch out for and to make sure that uh, our systems are, as Tim was saying, reliable, repeatable, um, high performance, and uh, can be easily used in an educational context. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'll point out here what I've got set up. Basically, I have a, an off-the-shelf DC motor here. It's got a gearbox on it and a Hall Effect encoder. Um, so essentially, the at the other at the output shaft of the gearbox, we're looking at roughly the same um, resolution in the encoder as the Cube Servo has. Um, but then this has quadrature, so it becomes a little bit better. But they're more or less on par. This is obviously a, a much smaller form factor. It has a gearbox. The Cube Servo is direct drive, but they're they're more or less equivalent in terms of their speed and their ability to uh, move at inertia load in terms of their output torque. So they're they're somewhat comparable in terms of performance. What I've done is just 3D print a base here for this one, so I can hold it in place. Another thing that uh, you'd perhaps take on if you were doing a DIY solution, and then. Uh, I have that wired up to an Arduino board. This is an Arduino Mega with a motor shield on top to take care of my power requirements. And I've got a power supply for that and a oscilloscope here, which will give me an idea of what the voltage is uh, at the motor, um, which is a, a PWM voltage. So this will give me an idea of what the average voltage is so I can get a feel for what the motor is doing. Um, and then, as I said, we have our standard cube servo here. There's a inertia load missing off the top just so that it's a little bit free. Um, in terms of a low inertia like this motor is here, but this is essentially what the inertia load would look like if you were to purchase a cube servo. There's also a pendulum attachment, but for today we'll leave that off. So the first thing I want to talk about is essentially some hardware quality things that you might come across if you're using this for education. So a couple of the things that we really carefully look at when we're outfitting a DC motor for educational purposes are nonlinearities because when you're modeling and controlling a servo motor, um, ideally you'd like it to be as linear as possible so that your models fit nicely and your controllers are designed correctly and everything sort of is as close to the theoretical as possible so the students can really immediately see the bridge between the theory and the practical applications and how the two can still differ but at the same time are quite equivalent. So there are two fundamental um, aspects of linear that I'm going to show. One of them is um, stiction or static friction that the motor has to overcome initially. And another one is purely the linearity of the amplifier, which are two things that we take a lot of time and effort to overcome. So to give you an idea of the DIY solution, first of all, um, I put together just a very simple Arduino sketch here. Essentially, I'm reading the encoder that's on it, and I'm commanding a voltage out to the, uh, the motor. Just really quickly, I'll touch on this later, but you can see it's a very complex program I've had to put together here in C just to do a simple task like read an encoder and write a value to the motor. So this gives you a flavor of the sort of background knowledge you have to have to be able to build up a DIY solution just using a simple Arduino and DC motor. But enough said. Um, essentially, I'm going to just give it out a command. In this case, I'm going to give it a, a command of 18, which is roughly equivalent to somewhere around 450 to 500 milliamp. So that should be roughly around um, a value that will just get the motor started moving without too much, uh, too much stiction or too much friction. So you can see it's moving very slowly. Um, I can still stop it very easily. So it's just on the border of being able to move. Um, and that value there that you have to overcome before you even get a movement out of the output shaft um, is, as I said, roughly around 400 to 500 millivolts, depending on uh, what you define as being a solid movement and what your inertia is and stuff like that. But in this case, let's call it 400 millivolts. Um, to do the equivalent experiment on our Quanzer solution, I'm going to use MATLAB Simulink. And I'm going to open up a new window here in my Simulink uh, library. And this is essentially my 
palette that I'll start working on. I'm going to take advantage of the Quark RCP tools so I can very quickly build up my solution here to uh, do the equivalent type of um, operation. Um, I'm going to use the search bar, but essentially all of these can be easily found in the Quark targets menu along the side of the library, but just to save time, I'll grab out the ones that I need. So this is my hill initialize block, which will set up all of the hardware interfacing for me. All of that code I had to put into the encoders and writing out the analog pins, that's all going to be taken care of just with this simple block. So I tell it I'm using a cube servo USB, and now I'm ready to go. I'm going to write an output value, so I'll get my hill write analog, so I can output to the motor. And uh, I don't think, I'll, yeah, sure, why not? I'll read the encoder. Um, I'm not really going to do much with it in this case yet, but I'll read the encoder just to show that it's moving. And uh, go up here, grab myself a constant so I can send it a voltage, and I'll grab myself a scope. Now, scopes are something that is also very challenging to do on a DIY solution with an Arduino, and also very easy to do in Simulink. Um, I'll touch on that in the next step, but essentially, be aware that that's coming. I'll open up my scope here. Let's say I give this a value of 0.4 volts, which is what the other one was doing. Um, I'm going to switch to external mode so I know the timing is working nicely, and I'll set my default options so that it configures all of the back-end coding for me. Um, I'm going to build an external model so that I have some real-time code that I can run off of that uh, I can rely on for accurate timing. Um, connect to my target and give it a run. And just like that, my cube servo is moving. I can see that I'm getting values out of my encoder here. Um, so just like that, everything's up and running. That took maybe two minutes, as opposed to the interface that I have on my DIY solution probably took me at least two or three hours just to get that very basic initial point. So you can see purely the initial buildup of a solution on the software side is much, much quicker. Um, as I was saying in terms of the friction, that was moving very nicely. So if I bring this down to even, let's say, 0.15 milliamps, so 150 milliamp, we'll see if it's still uh, able to keep moving here. Just quickly rebuild my model. And uh, once that's done, connect to it, give it a run, and you can see it's still moving. I'm still getting a value out of my motor, turning away at only 150 milliamps. So we're less than half of the voltage required to move the DIY solution, and it, we have a nice solid movement out of the um, cube servo. And initially, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But when you're modeling your system and you're looking at your control and that sort of thing, control will normally overcome that sort of thing to a certain extent. But you are going to have, depending on the quality of your motor and the friction that you have in your motor and the gearbox, some issues with backlash and some issues with this sort of static friction where all of a sudden, when you give it a PD controller without an integral, so without an ability to overcome that steady state error, you'll start to see, you'll start to see a big steady state error because the motor is not doing what you think it should be doing compared to your model. And so to overcome that, our cube servo is outfitted with these sorts of measures taken into account. So when you give a step to this cube servo, the response of the motor is going to be very close to the theoretical response. So the students can immediately see, wow, this model really works, the math is real, everything's coming together. Um, one other thing that I want to touch on along those lines is uh, if I look at linearity of the uh, if I look at linearity of the system, particularly with the amplifier, but uh, linearity overall of the system in terms of how as you transition through the full voltage range of the motor, the, uh, the output speed of the system is consistent. I'm going to just run this little demo here. It's very similar to the other one that I ran, except in this case, I'm going to start with a voltage of right around 1.2 volts, and I'm going to increase it every two seconds until I get to the end result of the the full range of this motor, which is in 6 volts. Um, now, how am I going to look at this data? I'm measuring data. It's coming through my encoder. I'm sending it voltages. But I really have no idea what it's doing, except that I have my oscilloscope in the back there where I could manually plot out my data. I'd like to plot this a little bit more easily than that. So what I did was download this serial chart system. And this basically enables me to um, at least get a plot out of the serial port of this Arduino. So. I'm going to start this running, and I'll relaunch my system here. And you can see now I'm getting some data. I've got a plot at the bottom, so I have a feeling that it's doing what I think it should be doing. But I'm still not entirely sure what the values are, what, ex what the exact measurements that I'm getting are. 
what the exact voltages it is outputting are. So once this finishes, now I'm going to have to take this data on the side here, copy that into Excel, or I guess you could use MATLAB, but I'll use Excel just for, for speed. Um, I'm going to split this data so that uh, everything is uh, a little bit clearer. So now I've got some data in here. I can grab the first two columns. I can create a plot. And I'll start to see the same thing I had a minute ago. So there's my response. This is my speed response to the motor in uh, degrees per second. So I have a feel now for what it was doing. Um, but I mean, this is like an, an unnecessary step. You don't get an immediate idea of what the value is. You have to go through a number of hoops just to get a feel for what's happening. Also, you may have noticed this was supposed to run for 10 seconds. And it ran for much longer than 10 seconds because the Arduino, despite the fact that I have a timed loop, is not running in real time. Um, that could come into play depending on the complexity of your system and how accurate your controllers are and how much drift you're going to have over time. That gets into why I was using the real time code in Quark. But essentially, that's another thing that you'll notice that you'd have to overcome is the timing on these systems is really not real time. It does its best, but you're not going to end up, especially with complex systems like this, with anything near accurate real-time sampling, down to the resolutions that we need. I'm running at 100 hertz, but often for some of our systems, we need to go 500 or 1,000 hertz. Back to the linear, <laughs> linear systems. Sorry, I digressed there a little bit. Um, so looking at this, let's take a, get a feel for uh, the linearity of our, our, speeds, our speeds here. So our first value, it looks like it was around um, 1625. Um, our second value up here, roughly, let's say, 3480. And our third value is 4645. Second last value, 5264. And our final value of 6193. So those are the values that we got in terms of speed. Um, for what this system was doing. If I do a simple line plot, you'll see that's not a hugely linear response. There's a little bit of a hump in the middle. It dips down a little bit more. You're not really getting a nice linear response out of this system. There could be reasons for that. But the primary reason I suspect is that you're not actually getting the voltage that you're commanding out of the system in a linear way. Um, that gets back to linear amplifiers and how with these systems that use PWM, it's much more difficult to get a linear response. Um, I could measure out the linearity of the system in terms of what the voltages that I'm reading are. Um, just to save a little bit of time, I'm going to quickly flip over to one that I put together earlier just to give you an example of what that sort of thing would look like. Um, so here's a full analysis that I did here. And uh, you can see that they're a pretty close match between the speed that I'm going to get the output and the voltage that it's commanding as measured using the oscilloscope. So the long and short of it is that the amplifier that I'm using here for my PWM signals for my DIY solution is not linear. It's got a lot of humps and dips, and it's not going to give me the response out of the motor that I would predict so that when I tell my students, with your linear controller, when you give it one volt, it's going to go 1,000 degrees per second. And when you give it two volts, it's going to go 2,000 degrees per second. That's not going to happen. Um, so let's just take a quick look at the cube servo and see how that fares. So what I'm basically going to do is first I have to measure my speed. So I'm still going to read my encoder. First of all, I'm going to have to convert it to a usable value. Let's say that we convert it to something that I can read in uh, encoder counts from encoder counts to something like degrees. So I'm going to do uh, just a gain of 0 0.176 and that'll give me degrees out of my encoder counts. And then I need to differentiate it. So normally we would use a, a differentiating filter um, just because that'll get rid of a little bit of the noise that uh, crops up because we're taking an encoder and using it to measure speed. So I'll plug that in here. Um, I'm going to use a value on my uh, differentiating filter here of uh, 50s over s plus 50. So it's a simple um, little differentiator here that will do a little bit of filtering and uh, give me a speed out of here. So I'll rebuild this and I'm going to probably have to increase my voltage a little bit to get a nice value out of here. So uh, let's say that I command one, 2 volts. Um, 
connect my code, open my scope, give that a run. And you can see I'm getting a speed, but I'm getting this weird dip that should happen at a regular interval. Now that dip is because there is a buffer on our DAC that's built into the cube servo that measures the encoder counts, and that's overrunning. It's wrapping and back to zero every now and then, because I'm getting a lot of encoder counts as my motor sits there spinning. So to overcome that, we've built in a block here called the inverse modulus block. You'll find it in a lot of our models. And basically, what that's going to do is make sure that when it gets to the end of that buffer, it doesn't actually overrun. So I know that the buffer for the cube servo has a value of 2 to the 16. So I'll put 2 to the 16 in there, rebuild this, and that should take care of that just immediately. So I don't have to worry about that buffer overflowing anymore. Just uh, connect back to my model. And now I'm getting a nice value out of this, nice smooth value without much of a dip. So let's take a look at, uh, at 2 volts, what sort of value we're getting. So it looks like we're getting more or less 2650 out of here. So if I open up a new sheet, let's mark down 2650 at 2 volts. I'm going to do 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Um, another way that, uh, by the way, you could make the noise here a little bit better would be as opposed to using a hill read encoder, um, we also have time-based blocks built into Quark. So I can tie it into the nice deterministic time base that the cube servo has. So if I do a hill read encoder time base, as opposed to just my hill read encoder, all of a sudden this is going to be a rock solid um, measurement and, and clock that I'm running off of, because it's no longer based on my laptop here. It's going to be running on the hardware. So uh, I'll use that from now on, get a little bit more consistent measurement. Flip this over to 4, connect back to my model, give that a run, and you can see now it's a perfectly clean signal that I'm getting out of that motor in terms of my, uh, my speed measurement. So that looks like now it's at 5,500. I'll uh, just quickly drop, drop that in there. And I'll do, let's do a couple more just to get a nice body of data. Um, all right, there's another measurement. That guy looks like it's about 8,300. And I'll do one more just to finish up my linear plot here, hopefully linear plot. And uh, this guy is going to be, you can change these values, by the way, on the fly. I'm just stopping it so that I can take my measurement about uh, 1111. So that's going to be about 11,110. So if I plot this, I could keep going to the end, but um, pretty certain we're going to be fine. You can see it's a rock solid line. Perfectly linear. This is tuned so that the response is exactly the way you think it should be and it's uh, totally predictable using the mathematical rigor that you would normally have in a controls or a mathematical course. So that's just a little insight into uh, a couple of the things that uh, you would have to take into account. The last thing I want to touch on is just to speak again to the, the sheer complexity that you need to overcome when you're building your DIY solution and why the tools and the thought that we put into our systems is there to make your life easy if you want to either analyze your systems using our solutions or move forward into your own custom solutions. So very quickly, I built up a simple PD position controller here. You can see again the complexity is becoming pretty high now. I've got a lot of different loops in here, a lot of different interrupts that I'm servicing for the encoders, data that I'm passing back. I have my pseudocode here for my PD controller, which isn't entirely intuitive if you've been using block diagrams to learn about control, but it's okay. So if I uh, give this a run, I'm going to be commanding back and forth with 40 degrees. Um, I have to stop my serial monitor, otherwise that's not going to work. Um, You'll see my uh, motor will start hopping back and forth, and uh, I'll just have to open up another set of configurations here just to be able to monitor this. If I give this a run, you'll see here that I've got some output happening on my motor. So I am following my position commands. I got a little bit of overshoot here and there, and you can see there's quite a lot of offset in my response because there's, as we talked about, quite a bit of nonlinearity here due to the gearbox and the friction and stuff like that. But I'm getting a response out of it. I've got my PID, my PD control working. Um, now, just to do something like this took hours for me to develop this and tone it and get rid of the errors I was having, figure out how to do the serial interface to get my data out. I'm going to do that right now in Simulink and for the cube servo with the model I've already got set up here. So really quickly, I'm going to get rid of my scope. 
I'm going to need a few more components here that I'll drop in. I'm going to need uh, a couple of summation blocks and uh, a few more gains. Let's just drop a couple more in there like that. So I've got my speed coming in here. I don't entirely need speed if I'm going to do position control, so I'm going to get rid of that block for now. That's going to come up here, and uh, I'll need a signal generator just so that I can give it the command that I want. So I'll drop that in there, change that to a square wave, Let's say we stick to 40 degrees. Um, so that'll come into my summation block here, make sure I've got negative feedback, or else that's going to be a problem. Um, I'll just set up a very simple PD controller here. Um, let's give it a pretty low value. It would be a little bit higher if I had my inertia load on here, but in this case it's not going to be quite so high. Um, there's my differentiating filter that I had earlier, so that's going to take the now the differentiation of the error. Um, I'm going to keep this really small in terms of my gains because I have a feeling that without the inertia load it's going to be pretty low and uh, drop in my scope, oh, sorry, drop in my analog right. So just like that, I've built up my PD controller, all done. Um, give this a build, and unless I made some silly errors, this should basically be able to give me much the same response as the other system was doing with far, far less time. So you can see here that uh, there's my response. It's a little bit of noise, so I might have to reduce my gains a little bit. Let's bring that down a little bit. There you go. Beautiful. So there's my position response, um, just like that. No hassle, no trouble, no hours of configuration. Right out of the box, few blocks, and uh, everything's ready to go. The last thing I wanted to talk about is that aspect of customization that Tim talked about earlier, where despite the fact that you're getting all of this out of the box, all the elements we've discussed, you are to a certain extent losing a little bit of the customization that you might want to have for your lab to get really the exact um, system that you're looking for for your particular curriculum and your particular goals for your course. So because of the power of Quark that we were showing you here, you can't, it's not just that you can rapidly create these controllers, but also you have the ability to quickly interface with all sorts of other stuff. We have blocks for Microsoft Connect, blocks for webcams, all sorts of third-party devices. So it's just as easy for me to talk to my Cube Servo here as it is for me to talk to something like a Microsoft Connect on a mobile robot. So you can totally customize your systems in terms of off-the-shelf third-party peripherals, but also we uh, totally support you 3D printing attachments for Cube Servo if you want to make your own modules. Um, and also, if other people in similar situations have created custom labs and custom solutions for you, as Tim talked about earlier, we have our online community where you can search for those sorts of things and download them, upload them for free if you come up with your own. So uh, let's say I look in here for my examples. I want to see what other people have put together and uh, how some of that material might benefit me. Um, this will all be live basically this fall, in the next few weeks, so it'll be totally open for you to access. You can see we put together some Cube Servo haptic examples, some um, fuzzy controllers for a two-dot fall balancer, we have visualizations of segways, helicopters, connect sensor demos, all sorts of stuff in here that you can use to enrich the experience you have with your Cube Servo right out of the box without any hassle to really make it a custom solution that's directly targeted at your particular needs in terms of curriculum and in terms of hardware performance. Um, that's all I've got for, uh, for now in terms of this. I'm going to pass it back to Tim and he's going to just uh, discuss a little bit more on these uh, types of demos we put together for how you can customize your system and then we'll wrap it up with some questions. All right, thanks Pete. And uh, yeah, basically what I'm just going to show right now is just to go over uh, I have a few videos here to, to highlight some different applications that you can uh, expand on the the uh, cube with. So as uh, Pete had mentioned there, one of the things was uh, connecting with a uh, Kinect. So here with this platform, we're actually using a Kinect and an NIMI Rio. So this is all through LabVIEW. But uh, as you can see, what's uh, happening here is that uh, we actually had a, a high school intern, uh, William, who basically put this example together. 
And what he's doing is he's using the Kinect to record his position of his hands uh, as he's swinging them back and forth. And as he swings them back and forth, it's moving the pendulum on the, uh, that's on the cube servo. So uh, again, relatively easy and straightforward uh, uh, connection for him to be able to, to put this together. Uh, and again, I apologize if there's a little bit of a, a glitch in the video there that might be, a, a, it may not have come through uh, properly, but again, we'll have a recording of this uh, made available. Uh, another example that we have is uh, this one's using uh, 3D printed parts and, and customizing the cube servo by using a ball balance. So here for this example, uh, we have a ball that is being balanced on, on a beam. And this beam was just printed off with uh, the interface there was a, is a 3D printed part. Uh, the beam was just constructed to attach to the uh, 3D inter or the printed interface there. So uh, as we'll see in a second, it's just using the magnetic uh, quick, quick change uh, face or interface of the cube servo. So it's just a, basically a few magnets that, that had to be added to it. And then it allows you to give that whole uh, DIY type hands-on customization that you'd want for uh, any of your labs or for uh, research purposes. And the last example that I have here is actually taking two cube servos being used together uh, for a driving simulator. So right now we basically have a, 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 almost like a gaming interface that's being used with this. Uh, so seeing where the, as the, the car drives along, we have one cube that is basically being used for the uh, speed and the other one that's being used for the position. And the two of them are interacting with each other as well as with the, uh, the software. So as you can see, as you stop one, it stopped the movement of the car. I, you could also take over the position of one of them to be able to make the, the car move uh, along a particular path. So you can make it stop and go, change its directions, et cetera. So again, this is, based, this is really making it have more of like a, a gaming environment or a game feel to it. All right, so what we talked about today was really just looking at uh, DC motors and, and uh, servo type solutions uh, being the pretty much the, the foundation or the building blocks of, of a lot of different uh, experiments. So at Quanzer, what we were showing you now is what we uh, have as our mid-range type uh, experiment with the, the cube servo. It's a fully integrated uh, teaching platform for intro to control theory. Uh, it was designed specifically for uh, teaching in mind. Uh, it comes with comprehensive courseware and can easily scale from classroom to industry. So this is a, a one-stop shop. It's, everything is contained in one, uh, basically in, in one unit and you just have to plug it in and away you go. And this can easily be integrated with, a, it has a USB panel on it, which is what we were using today, but it also has a direct IO options and uh, options for the uh, NI Myria. Now, we also have for, uh, for more straightforward introductory type things for DC motors, uh, we have a QNET DC motor board, and this, is, uh, this was built uh, specifically for the NI Elvis. So this is ideally suited for fundamentals of motor uh, servo control. So this plugs into the uh, NI Elvis. It's a bit more limited in the functionality that you can do compared to the Cube servo, but it is uh, using the, the Elvis platform to be able to give you different, uh, or teach you different aspects of uh, DC uh, servo motor control, so things like uh, positioning and speed control and modeling experience. Uh, and also for the, uh, the Elvis platform, we do have other types of models that can be used for that as well, other types of boards. Now on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, our flagship product here from Quanzer, which is the uh, rotary servo or the uh, SRV02. This is our high quality base unit for teaching and research. So this is where that modular approach really does uh, come into play. Uh, this has, on, on its own, it has 10 add-on modules that can be uh, easily attached to it for various types of uh, research and teaching applications. Uh, and when you put all that together, it basically, we, we provide you with a comprehensive courseware for over 30 labs once you put everything together. And just to kind of give you a, an idea of the modules for the rotary platform, we have things such as flexible joints and uh, flexible links. Uh, ball and beam, gyro stable platform, uh, inverted and double inverted pendulums, uh, and then ways to be able to integrate multiple uh, servos together, such as with our uh, two-dot robot or a multi-dot portion. So again, ways to be able to take uh, take that base unit, use it for with the with the uh, straightforward inertial loads like a, a disc and link that come with it, 
and then being able to expand on to various types of applications. So as we had said earlier, this is just the, the beginning of what you can do with uh, control theory uh, is using that, that servo motor as your base unit. But at Quanzer, we also have expertise in various types of domains. So here's just a, a real quick overview of some of the other domains that we, uh, that we currently cover. So we have linear motion control systems, flight control systems, haptic systems, uh, structural dynamics, so things like uh, uh, active mass dampers on shake tables, hexapods, things like that, uh, robotic and autonomous systems, so uh, two dot planar robots, uh, a flying cue ball, uh, as well as a, a cue bot. Uh, we also have from in, for industrial applications and process control, things like uh, mag, um, magnetic levitation, active suspension, coupled tanks. And then on top of all of this, we also have the peripherals that you would need as well, whether it be a linear voltage and current control, power amplifiers, DACs, uh, et cetera. And then the most important part that's sometimes overlooked is the software. Uh, you can easily integrate our solutions with standard software such as MATLAB Simulink through Quark, which is what we had showed you today. That, that allowed Pete to build up those models quickly and easily in the uh, uh, Simulink environment, as well as uh, the RCP toolkit for LabVIEW if you're using the, uh, the LabVIEW environment. All right, so uh, that's all that we have uh, uh, for today for our presentation. Uh, we do have a little bit of time left now to be able to go into a, a Q&A. So uh, I just ask if you do have any questions that you uh, open up your chat window or your question window on the, on the side panel there, and then feel free to enter any questions that you may have, and we'll try to get to them uh, right now.